friendly fire, you're going to hit the enemy. Well, now, because we found that one bit of chromosome here and that one bit of chromosome there that come together, we can create a molecule that goes after the one specific area of the problem, what we call targeted therapy. And we're on that edge right now with multiple myeloma. We're understanding those genes allows us, wouldn't it be nice, instead of going up and blowing up the whole building, you could just go and turn the light switch off and it's gonna make the work ineffective. That's the kind of work that we're doing. And so a further step is not only looking at the big cluster of genes, but going down further, as we already saw some wonderful slides, of what we call fish. So, so when you're there with your, your, your physician taking care of you, you come to see us at Mayo, we're gonna go fishing, right? Tell your doc, I want, to go, I want you to go fishing for my disease to understand this thing called fluorescent in situ hybridization. There's no test at the end of this program, I don't have to memorize that. But what happens now is we look, kind of like I talked about that Philadelphia chromosome, we can look at very specific changes, not just the big picture, but the small picture to help us understand what's going on with those genes. So we do cytogenetics, genetics, and we do these things, and again, this is, this is not meant to scare you off this slide, but the idea here is just to show to you that this is a proposal that Dr. Fonseca and others have had over the years showing, <coughs> instead of thinking of, of myeloma as one disease, here is, here is where we think of it as five diseases. So if someone has this genetic abnormality, unfortunately, they tend to have a poor prognosis, whereas if you have something called hyperdiploid state, then there's a better prognosis. And this severely influences, ultimately, the way we treat people. I'm not going to show you too many curves here, but just to show that there's a difference in survival. So what happens, unfortunately, as this curve is dropping, patients are dying, that if you have these kinds of things, which are unfortunately bad, it means that more people die more quickly than if you have this sort of thing, where people, thankfully, live a little bit longer. So I'm privileged to be part of a group, and I'm not here to be a commercial for Mayo Clinic today, uh, but to let you know that uh, at Mayo Clinic, we have this number of physicians whose focus is exclusively in multiple myeloma. This is the largest myeloma group in the world. Uh, and again, I'm not really meant to be a commercial. I put the ones in blue that are here in Arizona. The ones in black are from uh, Rochester, and, and Vivek Roy here uh, is working with us in Florida. And so we have the privilege of working with people where we can get a, a whole group of people as a team uh, to work together against multiple myeloma. We've created this thing called MSMART, uh, which is uh, meant to try and help treating doctors across the country and across the world now to how do we think about patients with those things we just talked about, how we're applying that research to the way we care for patients. If you want, you can look up msmart.org. So in the old days then, we'd say, well, this is the staging, and, and people learned all the different, they come to us and say, doctor, do I have uh, salmon dury stage one? And, or do I have ISS stage one, two, or three? These staging mechanisms are important, but as we learn more about the disease, we're learning that these staging systems need to be replaced. And don't, no disrespect to them. I'm very good friends with Brian Dury myself, and if you were here, I'd say the same thing to him. But these are systems that are changing as we evolve now to recognize that it's not just the way the plasma cell looks, but it's part of those mechanisms that we just heard. And as we understand it better, there's all these, this slide is meant to be complicated so that you don't try and memorize it, but to show that all these different arrows have a place where we might be able to introduce a drug that's gonna benefit the way we treat people. We've already heard about the NF-kappa B pathway, which is to us one of the most exciting pathways in multiple myeloma that we can attack to try and better patients. We're doing it in combination with other uh, signaling pathways. That's just because, you know, we're visual learners, we like to see things in color. Uh, to show that here, there's a whole series of things that happen to patients with multiple myeloma that we can target with time. So, better understanding, number two, better treatments. I'm going to be brief with this, of course, but this is perhaps, if you've been asleep, this is the time to wake up. This next minute or so is the most important part of the talk. I would suggest to you that right now there are three kids on the block, three big kids on the block, Thalidomide, bortezomib, and lenalidomide. Many of you are very familiar with these drugs. And these have really become the most important drugs that we have in the treatment of multiple myeloma. But what's happening now is that we're adding to this. First of all, we're learning how to combine them. How we put old with new and new with new and old with new. How is it that we can take some of these new school drugs, take them together with some of the old school drugs, mix them together and find that in fact we can even get more effective therapy for our patients. As I'm gonna show you in a minute, we even have better drugs. There are the newer generations of each of these drugs that are building on the great successes of these drugs that are, that are encouraging. You know, it used to be 
and, uh, despite my youthful appearance. Um, I've been doing this for a while. It used to be we'd sit in clinic with patients and say, you know what, we've got one or two bullets for the gun, and when we use it, that's it. It's all we've got, we have nothing left. Now we have more choices than we've ever had before. And I'll just close off with telling you a bit about clinical trials and networks. So this is just to show you, again, almost a dizzying slide, that using one of the three key drugs we mentioned, bortezomib, here's just an example of a slide that I put together in January, of, or that we put together in January of this year, demonstrating all the different combinations just with bortezomib. Uh, uh, the authors that are putting together, the number of patients that are involved, uh, many of these are, are uh, international studies. Similarly with lenalidomide, a Revlimid, um, one of the most, if not the most active agents in multiple myeloma right now, can, can combining it with other therapies, we're starting to see remarkable results. Um, not only in upfront therapy, but in relapse disease, when the disease comes back for both lenalidomide and bortezomib. Again, just to show you that there are all these different combinations. Five years ago, this would have been unheard of in multiple myeloma, and this has all literally happened in the last five years. And then, of course, when we conduct these studies, it's important for you to understand that we have different what we call phases of clinical trials, where a phase one study we have to test, is this agent safe after we've tested in the lab and often in animal models, is it safe? And then a phase two study to see how well it works, and then ultimately a phase three study, of which most of those studies I showed you were, where we compare it to the standard of care. This is my most important slide, because this demonstrates to us, look at all the different drugs that are now available in testing for multiple myeloma. And this is overwhelming. I wouldn't have imagined literally three years ago that I could present this kind of slide to a group of patients. Um, I would say that probably at least two-thirds of them we have available to us uh, here at the Mayo Clinic. And again, not to be a commercial Mayo Clinic, but uh, I wasn't late because I was coming back from uh, New Zealand. I was late because actually I've been on call and I've been in the hospital all morning. But I pulled out our list this morning. We currently have 29 open clinical trials in multiple myeloma alone. Um, and mo many of these drugs are being used in that context. And so very often when people have no other option, they're able to come to us and we can provide them options. This is just to show you, uh, we have a, 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 we call a, proto a protocol catalog, and I just clipped us off the website yesterday to show you that here we have 29 studies ongoing in multiple myeloma, some of them in newly diagnosed patients, many of them in relapse disease. So whereas in the old days, we had a couple of drugs and we weren't sure what to do with people and once people had relapsed disease, we had few options. Now these lines are getting taller and taller and taller as we can treat patients with multiple myeloma. Better networks. We've created something called the International Myeloma Working Group and there are about 60 of us worldwide that meet three or four times a year uh, to really discuss the state of the union, if you will, for multiple myeloma. We've made consensus statements as to how to diagnose the disease, what is the best optimal uh, therapies for the disease, both frontline and a relapse disease. It's been a network that all of us have tremendously benefited from. I'm, I'm privileged to be one of these 60. Uh, in fact, Mayo Clinic uh, has one of the two co-chairs, and we have eight of us out of the 60 uh, in Mayo Clinic, and there's 